this is an introduction to the mic 21 uh, fm show line morphology mod just a very brief um, introduction to myself so uh, i have a master's and a phd in, in coastal engineering and coastal morphodynamics and i've been working with the uh, dhi since 2007 mainly in denmark and in perth um, and i'm presently located in or mainly in, in Denmark and in Australia, and I'm presently located in, in the Gold Coast in Australia. So I'm one of the main developers of this uh, shoreline model. And okay. at the same time, I'm also a product owner for all the marine sediment software development at DHI. Uh, that's a fairly new role to me, but uh, looking forward to that. So just very brief uh, agenda for today's talk so i'll give a very short introduction to coastal zone processes just to set the stage for the description of the of the shoreline model and then i'll i'll go ahead and and show some examples uh, from where we have used the model both some validation examples and also a, a, a practical example where where we have used it um, and then i'll i'll end with the discussion on the strong and the weak points of this uh, model as well as a very brief presentation on the ongoing developments that, that we are doing. So just very briefly on coastal zone processes, normally we divide, the, as engineers, we divide the, the coastal zone processes into cross-shore and longshore sediment transport processes. And that, that's, that is to simplify things uh, so that we can actually try to make some predictions about what is happening. So when we look at, at coastal erosion, we normally talk about two different mechanisms for coastal erosion. One is a flattening of the coastal profile due to offshore transport during large storm events. So that's sketched up here in the, in the top panel, where you can see during a large uh, storm event, we can have erosion on the upper beach and dune system, and that, but that sediment is then deposited further offshore in this area here. And then during subsequent fair weather periods, very often the sediment, this sediment actually moves back onto the beach. So this type of, of erosion where the, the profile is changing its shape, that is often reversible. And it's, it's often uh, characterized by uh, two different seasons, for example, a, a summer and a winter coastal profile where the winter profile will, will, will be uh, flatter than the summer profile due to changes in the wave climate. Then we have another type of, of uh, coastal erosion that is caused by gradients in the longshore sediment transport. And that's sketched uh, down here on the bottom uh, panel is shown a, a plan view of a beach. So the beach is in here and the, the ocean is out here. If we have gradients in the longshore transport along this coast, then these gradients can cause the shoreline to accrete or erode. And in this case, it's actually more of a general, uh, the, the, uh, not a general, but it's, it's the case where the entire coastal profile is moving onshore or offshore. And you can see in this case, the sediment, if we have erosion, the sediment is, is completely lost from the system. And therefore, this type of, this type of coastal erosion is normally not reversible and is, is more severe. Um, than the first type of coastal, er coastal erosion. So that's a good thing. As, as, as we'll see in a little bit, the, the shoreline model uh, can only deal with this second type of coastal erosion, the more severe type where the, where the profile is, or where the sediment is, is lost from the profile due to gradients in the longshore transport. So traditionally, we have uh, used two different types of tools for calculating sediment transport in the in the nearshore area in the surf zone. So we have these 2D depth integrated models, such as Mike 21, um, and we have used these models to give very detailed sediment transport patterns, say to study the sediment transport around uh, structures, um, and they are very good at that. But Historically, we've only been able to run them on a relatively short time scale. And that is, has been because of the computational effort of running them for longer has been too large. But now we have much better computers. So we can actually run them for a longer time. But the problem is that because we don't have a good enough description of this 
cross-shore erosion and accretion um, of the coastal profile, then the morphology in these 2D models breaks down over time. So the shape of the coastal profile becomes natural if we run these models for a long time. On the other hand, we have the one-dimensional shoreline model, such as lead drift or lead line. And these models have been very successful in simulating the shoreline position on long time scales. So we can run these models for 30 years fairly quickly and get a good, get a good estimation for, for how the shoreline position changes. Um, but of course, because it's a one dimensional model, then 2D effects, they are only included using some type of parametric formulations. And we don't get any detailed sediment transport patterns. And I see the disadvantage of these models is that the parametric formulations, they very, work very well in some simple cases. So if you have a, a groin on a, on a uniform coastline, then, then they give good results. But if we have more complex cases, if we have submerged structures, or if we have up offshore breakwaters on complex bathymetry, then it's... Uh, then it's less uh, less certain that these parametric formulations will work very well. So what the Mike 21F flexible mesh shoreline model does is it tries to bridge the gap between these two models. So the concept is very similar to a 2D, 2D depth integrated model where we have a, a mesh, a 2D mesh with a bathymetry, we have a wave model, we have a hydrodynamic model, and we have a sediment transport model. So the main difference between this new model and, uh, and the, the normal 2D uh, area model is that we are constraining the morphology in the shoreline model. And the way we are constraining the morphology is that we are pre-describing what the coastal profile should look like. So by pre-describing the coastal profile, then we don't have to worry about uh, the cross-shore uh, processes not being accurate enough over long time scales. We can simply prescribe the coastal profile, and then we can run the model for a long time. So this is this is just a, another sl slide describing the model. So so what we're actually doing in the model is we're calculating the waves, the currents, and the sediment transport on the 2D area mesh, and then we're dividing the near shore area into these strips of shore face that are perpendicular to the shoreline. So an example of this is shown over here. This is from Palm Beach in Australia where we have these strips of shore face indicated by the different colors here. So the beach is in here and the ocean is out here. And once we have, once we have done this and divided this near shore area into these strips of shore face, then we can solve a modified equation for the, for the shoreline movement. So this is the normal one line equation, which states that the change in the shoreline position is equal to the gradient in the longshore transport. This is this term here, the QD, the QLDX divided by some area. So we reformulate that in terms of the volume of sediment that is deposited on each of these strips, divided by the area over which this volume is distributed. So that's the vertical area here. So this is a relatively simple model, but it uh, provides a, a robust model for predicting these shoreline changes over the long term for, for complex cases. So this is just an overview of the examples uh, I, I would like to show. So we have an idealized uh, offshore breakwater. We have an example with some groins and a mega nourishment and an artificial reef. And then also uh, the last example, an artificial beach in Tunisia. So the first example is this one. This is a very simple case. The beach is located in here. The waves are coming from out from this direction out here. And then we have a breakwater here. So we kind of know what we what we what we expect the model to do in this case, and that is to form a salient in the lee of the breakwater and to also cause some downdrift erosion because the sediment that goes into the salient is, is then missing on the down downdrift side. So you can see this model does uh, what we're expecting it to do, and we have very few assumptions. So the main assumption here is, is the, the coastal profile, which in this case is, has been set to a Dean profile uh, in, in this area here. But we are not prescribing anything about the behavior behind the, the breakwater. So in the, in the 1D model, such as, as lead line, there would be some parametric formulations that would, that would generate this salient here. That's, that's not the case here. 
because we are solving everything in, in 2D and only the shoreline model itself is, is a 1D description for the shoreline position. Uh, so we also, after we had run for the for the idealized breakwater, we thought that was great, but but uh, how does it actually compare to some measurements? So then we tried to run the, the model for a real offshore breakwater. So this is a comparison between the model and the measured uh, Sentient after a period of five years, so the breakwater was constructed, and then they went out and measured uh, the bathymetry five years after the construction, and, and we modeled it over here. And what we can see is we don't have a, a perfect match between the difference within the model and the measurements, but the volume of sediment that accumulates behind the breakwater shows a good a good agreement. Um, which, which is an important result, again, because we have very few assumptions um, in, the, in the model. So we were quite happy with this, with this result. Another example uh, here is the shoreline evolution uh, behind a shipwreck. Um, so this is a Turkish uh, bulk carrier that grounded 500 meters from the shore. This is near Cape Town in South Africa. And you can actually go in to Google Earth and, and see this uh, bulk carrier here. And you can see the, the bulk carrier grounded so close to the shore that it's acting as, as an offshore breakwater. And it causes the formation of the salient on the beach here. So in this case, the net literal drift is almost zero on this beach, but the gross drift back and forth along the beach causes um, or creates a salient due to the shipwreck. And you can see the, the model predicting, so the initial, the blue line here is the initial shoreline that we put into the model. And the red is the equilibrium shoreline with a representative wave climate that comes out of the, out of the shoreline model. You can see we capture the size of the salient fairly well, uh, even if the salient is located slightly towards the south in the model compared to the, to the measurements. But, but again, this is a strong, strong result because it's not a case where we're running uh, this model uh, many, many times in order to get the best result. It is very robust uh, because we don't have a lot of assumptions in there. So again, the main assumption here is the wave climate, representative wave climate, and the shape of the coastal profile. Another example is uh, an idealized groin field uh, where we can see how, how the model uh, Generates or how how the model uh, coast coast uh, responses due due to uh, due to a single groin here. In this case, we have uh, the mean wave direction is alternating between uh, two different directions, 345 degrees and 335 degrees, and you can see the model, the model is producing this sh shape of the of the coast here. So uh, again, this is a, uh, this 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 specific domain is an a longshore periodic domain. So that means it's actually simulating a, a field of, of, of these, uh, uh, these uh, groins are, or this domain keeps repeating itself in the alongshore direction. So it's sort of like a, a groin field. Um, so the next example I'm going to show, this is uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the, the Netherlands, where they have made a very, very big uh, beach nourishment, 21 0.5 million cubic meters uh, of sediment was nourished to a beach at, a, at, at uh, this location here. And this is this big nourishment is called the sand engine. So the idea is that you, you put in a very, very large uh, nourishment and then that feeds the neighboring beaches for the coming 20 years or so or something like that. But it's also a very interesting case because not only did they put in the, the nourishment there, but they also have a very uh, rigorous field campaign surveying the, the morphological development of this sand engine. So it's like a big field laboratory uh, where we can test our models, um, which we have done. So over on the left-hand side here is shown the, the initial two and a half years uh, morphological development measured from the sand engine. So this is the initial bathymetry right after construction. This panel down here shows uh, 
the, uh, the bathymetry after six months and then after one and a half years and after two and a half years. And you can see uh, that after two and a half years, we have about two and a half million cubic meters of sediment is eroded from the main part of the of the sand engine, so from this area here. And some of it deposits to the northeast in this area, and some of it deposits in the southwest in this area. And then a relatively large amount is, is unknown, so that means it's either been blown into the dune system or it's been lost to the offshore. So in the model, we, uh, we, what our main goal with this exercise was to try to, to get a, a, a good description of the overall shape of this sand engine in the model. So describe the overall shape. We're not looking so much into the in details of, of what the morphology looks like inside the embayment here, for example. It is more, more the, the, the outer, outer shape of the, of the depth contours. So when we set up the model, you will see that we we have used uh, the same profile all the, all along the beach, so also on the inside the bay. So that doesn't look uh, completely realistic, but it doesn't matter so much for the overall development of the sand engine. What happens in inside this bay here? Um, Another thing you will notice is that in the in the measurements and in the initial construction of the sand engine, the coastal profile here is very steep compared to the equilibrium profile that was already on the beach, and that's just because it was constructed uh, with with a certain slope here, which is different from the from the equilibrium slope slope. But you can also see after six months and after one and a half, or after one year, already after six months, this profile is much um, flatter than, than the initial one, and it resembles a lot more the, the equilibrium profile. So what we cho chose in, the, in, in our model was to simply use the equilibrium profile to represent the, the, the coastal profile right from the beginning. And as we shall see, it, 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 it doesn't have such a big effect uh, on the results. So these panels here show our model results after six months, after one and a half years, and after two and a half years. And I think, I mean, qualitatively, you can see our model is doing quite well. This the overall shape in the model and the, and the measurements is, is is quite similar. And especially, you can see this this very large asymmetric asymmetry that was in the hook shape in the initial sand engine. That's uh, becomes quite symmetric relatively fast in the measurements and also in the model. When we could then go in and look at the actual numbers, um, we can see that in the model we have eroded 1.8 million cubic meters of sediment from the main part of the sand engine, and then we're depositing, it, but depositing all of that towards the, or some of it towards the northeast and some of it towards the southwest. So you can see we are not quite, I mean, there is some dis discrepancies, but these numbers are actually quite uh, quite close, uh, I would say, considering we haven't really calibrated the model. So the main calibration uh, that was happening when we ran this model was uh, a calibration in order to get the correct longshore sediment transport al along the shoreline, along the undisturbed shoreline. That's the calibration that we did. And then we simply put in the initial bathymetry and ran the model. So it is a fairly robust uh, result, um, this. And you can also see that, that part of the discrepancy between the model and the, and the measurement, that's actually this, this sediment that is unknown. So some of that is blown into the dune system. Some of it is lost to the offshore. And those processes are not included uh, in the model. So we also try to run the model for 20 years. So this uh, this animation shows that 20-year development of the sand engine predicted by the shoreline model. And I think it's a very nice animation. You can also see here how that coastal profile is, is constant and it's receding uh, as as that main part of the sand engine is is eroded and and how it's it's accreting in, in down down in this area here. Um, so we are quite happy with this uh, comparison, and it, I think it shows that the model is, can reliably be used to to predict what will happen for these uh, nourishment campaigns. 
Yeah, so the next example, that's also a, sort of like a validation of the model. This is uh, for an artificial reef that was uh, built in, uh, in Queensland, in Australia, in the Gold Coast. It's called the Naranek Artificial Reef, and it was constructed from geotextile bags uh, in 1999 to 2000 and maintained by, by top-ups of these geotextile bags until 2006. So what happens when you place these bags in the surf zone is that they, they, they tend to break, uh, break a lot. So until 2006, uh, the reef was maintained, and then since 2006, there's not been any top-ups top ups, uh, since then. You can actually see it in, in Google Earth as these two uh, dark lines here. So the, the reef is, is there. And this is the most recent uh, bathymetry survey, so you can see that there is still uh, bags there, but it's not like a coherent, very coherent uh, reef structure, but, but there is still something out there. So our job was in this case to test to see how, how accurate or how good was the shoreline model at, at predicting the coastal response due to this artificial reef. And one of the, the problems here was that, that there's not a huge impact on the coastal uh, morphology from the reef. But when we went in and analyzed uh, the available data, we could actually see, so, so what this plot shows here, so this is the distance uh, along, along the beach, and then we have, um, we have uh, the volume of, of sediment at, at different uh, beach profile locations along, along the beach uh, at different times. So the first uh, red line shows the, the volume of beach uh, in 1998. So that's before the reef was installed and before a large nourishment campaign that happened at the same time as the reef was constructed was also completed. So you can see we have, uh, so these, these volumes have, have been scaled uh, and are compared to, to, the, to the, the volume or the beach volume at, in this profile in, in 1998. So here we have, uh, zero volume but that's just because it's been scaled to that to the actual volume there um, then you can see in in february 2001 we have a lot more sediment in the beach indicated by the yellow line here and we can also see that there's a clear salient uh, in the lee of the reef so the reef is located here and you can see in the lee of the reef there's a clear salient there most of this increase in the beach uh, width is due to a nourishment campaign that happened at the same time. The volume of, of sediment in that nourishment campaign is indicated by the dashed uh, white lines. So you can see it matches perfectly. I mean, here the, the increase in beach volume is from the red line up to the yellow line. So that's, uh, and that matches perfectly with the, with the white dashed lines. But we can still say that, that in, the, in these early days, there's a, a clear salient in the lee of the reef. Um, but then at later stages in 2012, 2011, we don't see the salient anymore. This is shown by the, these green and, and blue, blue lines here where we don't have that salient uh, seen. So while the reef was, was maintained, there was a clear effect. Uh, but la at later on when the reef was not maintained anymore, the effect was, was uh, much smaller at least. Um, what we found when we tried to uh, run the model for this uh, case was that the, co the shape of the coastal profile, so which is predefined in the model, they were very important for the model response to the reef. So what we did was we ran the model with five different uh, coastal profiles. So what, what is shown in this plot here is all the gray lines show all the available coastal profiles from, from a location nearby. And then we chose five different profiles that was kind of spanning the entire envelope of these of these available profiles. Um, when when we ran the model, uh, you can see the the measured uh, response. That's what was shown on the previous slide as well. Is this is the orange curve here, indicated by this orange curve here. And then when we run the model with the different profiles, we get an envelope of, a res of the response, uh, depending on, on which, uh, which profile we run with. And you can see the measured response is actually inside that envelope, except just on the downdrift side. So 
it seems that the model is, is doing a fairly good job of, of, of predicting the, the coastal response, but we are overestimating the downdrift erosion a little bit uh, in the model compared to the measurements. So this is a, at a later stage, um, and that the same is same is true. We are the measured responses inside the envelope, except uh, just on the downdrift side. So again, we were quite happy with this uh, result um, because it shows that that we can actually we can we can use the the, the model to predict uh, the coastal response due due to this submerged uh, structure. Um, even though the, the, we, we have to pre-describe pre the coastal profile, and that gives us a variability of the, the, the response, so that's important to be aware of. But the measured response is within that, that, that predicted uh, envelope of, of, of predicted uh, coastal response. Um, so the, the model seems to, it seems like we can use the model uh, also for, for designing these submerged structures. So this is just a, an animation. Uh, I don't, oh, it's not running so well uh, on the on the link, but it, it just shows a lot of uh, images of the shoreline at this location, and you can see how dynamic the shoreline is in the video. So this is why these predictions are fairly difficult, and why we have a large variability in our predictions. I think. Uh, this is a Pacific Ocean coastline, and, and we have very highly dynamic place. So the last example I want to show, this is a practical uh, example where uh, this uh, small city, or not small, this city in Tunisia, this is a tourist city in Tunisia, where uh, they have a very nice beach. And it's very important for them uh, to, to have a nice beach there because that's what attracts the tourists uh, to this location. But unfortunately, the beach is, is eroding. Uh, so they were very interested in getting a good shoreline management uh, scheme to, to stabilize the beach so that they could keep attracting tourists uh, to their beach. And DHI was then asked to investigate three different uh, management schemes um, Two of the schemes involved uh, submerged breakwaters, and one of the schemes that was designed by DHI involved a stabilizing groin. And all of these, these three schemes included an, an, a 350,000 cubic meter nourishment. And you can see the result from, from the shoreline model from running th these uh, three different uh, schemes. So this is the result from running with three submerged breakwaters, and you can see we get a some salience forming in the lee of all the breakwaters, and, and actually, this is a, a fairly good uh, good result. Uh, we are stabilizing a beach uh, with a certain width on, on, on the beach there. With the five uh, submerged breakwaters, um, we get less less pronounced salience, and we're still stabilizing a beach there. So that so that solution could actually also be used. And the stabilizing groin, where we just have a single groin at the end, that also works. So we are stabilizing a, a beach, and, and this is also a good solution. So DHI's recommendation was to, to go with the groin, and, and the reason for that is we can have a look at this. So this shows the, the flow fields uh, around the sub, these submerged uh, structures. So this is just one of these submerged structures. You can see here's the significant wave height. Uh, so we see the waves in the lee of the structures are, are much reduced, and that's, of course, what's causing this salient formation. And then down here, you can also see these are the current speeds. So because of these submerged structures have very large gradients in the, in the wave heights, they drive strong uh, currents in the lee. Uh, and this is not a very good uh, thing to have on a, on a tourist uh, swimming beach. Because if you have these strong uh, circulation currents, then that can be dangerous for people who are swimming on the beach. And this is only happening for the, the two uh, cases with the submerged uh, structures. For the groin, we see a little bit of circulation, but only close to the groin, all the way along the beach. We don't have these dangerous offshore directed uh, currents uh, that, that, that can be dangerous for the swimmers. So I think that was 
one of the main arguments for, for choosing the, the stabilizing groin um, as the solution. And I think this solution has been, been implemented by the, by the local council there, and, and they are quite happy with it. Yeah, so this is just a, a short uh, in. Uh, we have a, a 2017 uh, release of the mic uh, software coming out next year or th this year, later this year, and we have unfortunately not uh, many news in the shoreline model. We are still uh, letting it sink in from from the last release, but we do have one uh, new thing in the in the in the new release, and that's the possibility to include or exclude the sediment transport across the offshore boundary uh, into the shoreline morphology update. Um, so that, that gets a little bit technical, but um, essentially you can see when we when we are calculating the shoreline morphology, then the, the changes in the shoreline position is driven mainly by gradients in the longshore position. But there could also be transport across the, bit, across the offshore boundary and sometimes you would like to include that effect, and sometimes you won't, you don't want to include that effect, depending on depending on the um, on the case you are simulating. So we have added the, the option there uh, to to include or exclude uh, that offshore transport. Um, yeah. So what are the strong and the weak aspects of the new shoreline model? Uh, the strong aspects is that it's very flexible. We can use it for uh, curved uh, shorelines. We can have a very complex 2D bathymetry and, and, and complex wave field and current field. And all these 2D effects are, are in automatically included in the solution. The model is, is fairly robust. Uh, we have a lot less assumptions than, uh, than other shoreline models. The main assumption is that, that we're using a prescribed coastal profile. Uh, we also have a framework for as assessing the uncertainty due to, to the, the prescribed coastal profile. So we use that in the narrow neck study where we say, okay, we have to prescribe the coastal profile, but what is the variability of our predicted impact depending on, on, on the coastal profile? So that's, of course, something to, to keep in mind that that's a, a possible way around this, this assumption. Um, but I think the main strong new point is that, that the, this model actually opens up new possibilities for simulating long-term shoreline evolution in complex environments. Uh, so we can, we can give uh, better advice in, in these complex cases than, than we could before regarding, regarding the, the coastal uh, evolution. So what are some of the weak aspects? And I'd say the main weak aspect is the long simulation time. So uh, because we need to run, we need a 2D sediment transport field in order to calculate the shoreline morphology. So basically the simulation time is similar to the Mike 21 FM sand transport model. We have some speed up tricks that, that can get us through uh, simulations of up to 20 years. So for example, this simulation that I showed for the sand engine, that was 20 years uh, Simulation uh, simulation time and that and that took eight days to run on a normal laptop or not a laptop but a normal run machine. Um, the model is available on HPC on high performance computers. So if you have a big model and and you need to to run it for a long time, then it's, a, it's an option of of renting some some HPC time on one of the clusters and run the model there. I guess another weak aspect is this prescribed coastal profile. We always get uh, get some criticism for that, but but unfortunately, right now we have to live with it. I would love to have a model where I didn't need to prescribe the coastal profile, but right now the, that's uh, that's how it is. I don't we don't know of anyone who has a, a process based uh, model for long term coastal evolution that that includes these these cross shore processes. We are working on, on improving it, but we're not quite there yet. And as always, the modeler needs a good understanding of the coastal processes to ensure good results. So this model is not, although it's easy to use uh, and, and, and you can you can get uh, robust results, you always need to, uh, to be able to assess whether these results, uh, how, how good they are and, and, and what they mean. 
We have a number of ongoing developments. Um, so we are implementing a, a June erosion model uh, that that can implement that can calculate the June erosion and, and retreat uh, during storm events. We have a, a very simple one in there already where the June just erodes when the when the profile is eroded back, but but there so there will be some improvements to that. We are also working on uh, having a more dynamic coastal profile. So one uh, one easy one is is where the you predefine your coastal profile, but depending on depending on that it can vary. The predefined coastal profile can vary in time, and that could be used for, for example, for seasonally varying coast profiles or for sea, le- sea level rise. Uh, and then the last one we are working on this non-equilibrium uh, model, where we allow the the coastal profile to change. Um, it, it's shape, but we we have a diffusion term so that the, cha- the, the coastal profile will always move towards the equilibrium uh, profile. That has some advantages, and, and we are currently testing it, and hopefully it will be ready for, for release in the next version of the mic, of the mic zero.